Now, after workup and stabilization in the emergency room, all spinal cord injury patients should be managed in the ICU. That is primarily to prevent that secondary injury that we talked about. Um, and also the biggest thing to remember here is you still go ABCs of trauma, um, airway, breathing, circulation, just like any other trauma patient. Um, you don't want to get distracted by the spinal cord injury and forget the basics. Um, the absolute primacy of those ABCs um, really can't be overstated. Um, adequate perfusion and oxygen of the spinal cord are really key here to maximize recovery. And so even brief periods of hypoxia can trigger that secondary injury, which will ultimately increase morbidity, mortality, and decrease chances of improvement neurologically. ICU management for patients with spinal cord injury is important because the patients frequently um, will experience things like hypotension, arrhythmias, hypoxia, and airway compromise. Um, and that hemodynamic instability and ventilatory failure um, can even occur in a delayed fashion, even if the patients appear stable right after the injury. Um, this happens as their respiratory function worsens due to the secondary injury or as their chest wall muscles tire out. And all of these things can impact outcomes. So that's why we monitor these patients in the ICU. Um, you also want to avoid further um, secondary injury from common ICU events that would otherwise maybe be well tolerated in folks without SCI, um, but patients um, with spinal cord injury uh, will worsen neurologic outcomes. So examples of that include fever um, and hyperglycemia. Fever increases metabolic demand and hyperglycemia exacerbates neural injury. So um, avoidance of these secondary issues really just hinges on excellent ICU care, you know, treating fever early, treating hyperglycemia early. So when you're all um, uh, interns, uh, remember that, that's really important. Spinal cord ischemia is a common cause of secondary injury, and so that implicates, you know, the vasculature. Um, at the spinal cord level, direct injury to the microcirculation will result in vasospasm and loss of autoregulation, which alters the spinal cord blood flow. And at the more systemic level, um, of course, acute spinal cord injury is often associated with hemodynamic instability, which can affect perfusion. Um, this is particularly more common in cervical and complete spinal cord injuries. Hypotension in the setting of spinal cord injury and a trauma can have multiple etiologies, and you want to consider all of these in dealing with a patient with spinal cord injury. And the first thing you want to consider is just plain old blood loss or hypovolemia, just like all of the trauma patients. Um, you never want to fail to consider that possibility. But in spinal cord injury, you also need to consider loss of sympathetic vascular tone, which can cause hypotension. Um, typically, hypotension related to hypovolemia is associated with tachycardia, whereas hypotension seen with severe spinal cord injury is usually coupled with bradycardia. And hypotension in the setting of spinal cord injury, regardless of, you know, that cause is going to worsen that cord ischemia and, and worsen that secondary injury. So it needs aggressive treatment. Um, the first line treatment is going to be volume resuscitation, um, but it might not be enough. And so the second line treatment is usually vasopressors. There are blood pressure treatment guidelines for the acute phase of spinal cord injury based upon you know, the evidence that we have. Um, correction of hypotension, which means a systolic blood pressure um, less than 60 or 90, that's, that's hypotension, um, is very strongly recommended. Um, but then it's also recommended to maintain a uh, mean arterial pressure of 85 to 90 um, for seven days after a spinal cord injury. Um, and that is thought to improve spinal cord perfusion and, and ultimately potentially neurologic outcome. Um, many institutions employ this recommendation as well, and that is our institutional protocol as well for, for cervical cord injuries at WVU. Um, we keep people in the ICU for seven days for map pushes. Respiratory complications are also a major cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with spinal cord injury. Um, respiratory failure is common in spinal cord injury patients. And again, it's, it's more common in cervical and complete spinal cord injury. Um, the two phases of respiration, which are inspiration and expiration, are both affected after spinal cord injury. Inspiration requires contraction of the diaphragm and the intercostals, and these are controlled at the C3 through 5 spinal cord segment levels. So injuries above C3 essentially always require immediate ventilatory support or they will die. Um, in addition, even with lower levels of injury, the loss of the abdominal wall function in spinal cord injury leads to a decrease in expiratory force, um, and that can uh, impair the ability to cough and clear secretions. All these changes combine to, to lead to relative hypoxia and they can exacerbate the spinal cord ischemia that happens after the acute injury. Um, therefore, it's really important to identify patients at risk for respiratory failure and complications. 
the altered mechanics of respiration lead to a pattern of shallow breathing, which can be initially compensated for um, by increasing respiratory rate. However, that doesn't last long because it doesn't work to adequately oxygenate the patient. And so the overall result is, is a higher work of breathing, but also decreased gas exchange and then can lead to respiratory failure. Approximately one third of patients with cervical spinal cord injury will require intubation and you need to carefully monitor those patients um, and consider early intubation if they're starting to struggle. Um, generally, ICUs will have protocol for this, but um, in general, a decrease of FEC to less than a liter or increasing the respiratory rate or PCO2 are good indicators that you need to intubate. Patients with thoracic spinal cord injury are also more at risk for respiratory complications. Um, and it may not just be relating to neurologic compromise and altered breathing dynamics, but also um, may relate to just the overall force needed to cause a thoracic spinal cord injury. And so they may have a lot of concomitant other injuries as well, like root fractures. Um, and a significant pro um, proportion of the respiratory morbidity and mortality in spinal cord injury is actually also attributable to pneumonia, uh, including ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, and those patients um, have like anywhere from, I think a one to 3% chance per day of getting a pneumonia. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.